Okay, that should be working. <clears throat> All right, everyone, welcome. Um, my name is David Walker. I am the Information Services Librarian at Lincoln Memorial University's Duncan School of Law. I'm speaking with Catherine Marsh, who is the Faculty Services Librarian uh, at LMU. And until next week, when she will be the Information Services Librarian, and I will be the no, actually, Director of Learning Skills and ASP. But, um, but we're, we're uh, going to talk about basically our model um, of the library and hopefully um, they'll stir up a lot of questions at the end. We have a lot of pictures, too, so it's, it's going to be a very Pictorial. photographic presentation. All right, uh, quick agenda. We're going to talk about the library collection because that basically supports, our, our model for the library supports everything that we do. Um, we're talking about how we've embedded librarians throughout the building. Uh, we're talking about how we use virtual reference and actually um, in conjunction with the embedded librarians. Um, our circulation, which is uh, a self-checkout unit. Um, LibGuides as a type ready reference type of tool. Um, our legal research instruction and our teaching technology. Um, and I basically just want to start off by saying we do not have a reference desk and we do not have a circulation desk. And I will show you the building. All right, this is Lincoln Memorial University's uh, law school. Um, it was originally a Civil War hospital, originally for the Confederacy, but um, at later in the Civil War it was a uh, hospital for the uh, Union. Later it became the Tennessee School for the Deaf. Uh, they moved out. Then it became Knoxville's um, City Hall, which it's sometimes referred to as Old City Hall. Then it became, I think in the 80s, it was the Tennessee Valley uh, Authority. And for the last two years it has been the home to um, the Duncan School of Law. Now, it's nice, it's old, 1848, um, and then from the, the veneer, there's nothing really too old about it. Um, it's, we completely redid it. That LMU uh, sign is no longer there. Um, we had some issues with the Historic uh, Preservation uh, Society. All right, <clears throat> so I'm going to give you sort of an idea of what, what our collection looks like. This is um, our reading room. It's on the third floor. Um, and it houses what we consider our Tennessee practice materials. So we have Tennessee uh, decisions, uh, Tennessee statutes, Tennessee attorney general materials, Tennessee practice materials, like criminal offenses and defenses in Tennessee. <clears throat> and for some reason, we also have Wharton on evidence up there. It's not necessarily Tennessee, but I don't know, was Wharton from, Tennessee, from Knoxville? I don't know. Um, and it's, it's a very small collection. It's mostly our, it's a, a place for students to come and read and study. This is what people call the library. Um, this houses our federal primary sources, our, and uh, general secondary sources, uh, restatements, ALRs, uh, and our, our monograph collection. Now, our monograph collection as of, uh, what was it? Yesterday, I think, was 85, it's 85,000 including main campus. What do we have now, 20, 40,000? For about 40,000 uh, uh, books in print. But, see, people call this the library, but it's not really what we, we consider the library. I consider this the library. Just I consider the entire building to be the library because we have Wi-Fi out there. And with the ability to have Wi-Fi and all our students having laptop computers configured the same way, we have a collection um, of... Our local results are 1,191,845, of which 1,110,000 some are ebooks, 
a little over 300,000 are government documents, um, 42,000 serials, 873 video DVDs, 790 computer files, 553 video, 319 mixed format, 177 audiobooks on CDs, 144 music CDs for some reason, there's 138 sound recordings, 69 websites, 41 maps, uh, some audiobooks on cassette, <clears throat> some photos, and, and kit. Um, that's, our, that's what our Aqua Browser collection has in it uh, right now. So we are, have a very small print collection. I, I think it's mostly used for teaching. Like this is what, how people used to research. Um, except for our, I'd say it's mainly used for s students looking for, at horn books and treatises and whatnot. Um, it's, it's sort of s study aid. Now you might be saying, well with such a small print collection, how does this digital collection really work? And I'm gonna tell you the story about what happened about a, a year ago. Um, Jonathan A. a. Markintel, who was our associate dean for assessment, um, came to me, well, it was two years ago, we, we started work, working at LMU, and I said, John, you know, if you ever need anything from me or the library staff, just let me know. And he said, yeah, no, I don't really use librarians. Um, I'll just hire some research assistants and, and find everything I need. So about, I'm like, okay, well, it makes my life a little easier. Ten months later, he's, uh, he's writing an article. And he says, you know, I, I, need, I need some help. Uh, can you get me some stuff? I'm like, okay, what do you need? He said, well, I need the legislative history for the Constitutional Convention, legislative history of the Bill of Rights, legislative history of the 14th Amendment. Now I need both the convention and I need the, several the debates in the several states. I also need dictionary definitions for 10 words in every dictionary you can find between 1750 and 1790. And I said, oh, okay, so you never needed librarians. And so this was like the test of our collection, because, I, I mean, these are pretty historic materials. Um, and I, I logged on to the catalog, and I did my searches, and I actually found a good number of all that. I had a little trouble with the, uh, the debates in the states for some of the Bill of Rights stuff, but we had pretty much all of that. I went through both, um, and a lot of that was thanks to... Uh, making the Gale Digital Library 18th Century Online. That, that, was, that was a huge help. That, um, Hein was also a help. Um, and Google Books was a help, too. I found a lot of di dictionaries. At the same time, I said, you know, well, let me go check some other places. So I said, John, I'm going to Cali. Uh, and on the way, I can stop in Virginia and Charlottesville and see what they have in their archives in Virginia. And I can stop at Rutgers Archives when I'm in New Jersey. Uh, and I went and I, and I, I, I called uh, li the li one of the librarians at Virginia. She said, "You don't have to come. I'll just I'll find what we have and I'll uh, take pictures of you of it and, and send it." I said, "Okay, that's great." Same. And I go up to Rutgers and I looked at their dictionaries, and it turns out that we basically had all the material through our collection that they had in their archives. So it was gave me a lot of confidence in our collection. Um, and because we have a collection in digital format, primarily in digital format, where all of our students and our faculty <clears throat> and our uh, staff can access it 24-7, it makes life a little bit easier, especially for those who commute about 100 miles <clears throat> uh, just to go to class at night. Um, and with that, <clears throat> you still see students in their study. So what, we've, what, we, what the digital collection has allowed us to do is what Catherine will start just talking about now. Yeah. As David said, my name is Catherine Marsh. I'm the faculty services librarian. And I have the distinction of having worked at both of the law schools in Knoxville, Tennessee. So I started out at the University of Tennessee, which is a very traditional library and law school. So they've got a library wing, basically, a faculty wing, and a classrooms wing. And now I'm working at Lincoln Memorial University where everything is completely different. Everything is completely integrated. The librarians are embedded with the faculty 
And so it's been a transition for me, and I absolutely love it. So I'm hoping to share some of our success with you. This is one of our um, faculty hallways. It is actually an example of how we have librarians on every faculty hallway. Guess which door is the librarian's door? <laughs> yep, yep. Um, I'm going to go through our building for you. We have a four-story building. I can't remember how many thousand square feet, but it's, it's a good-sized building. Um, historical, as David said, 1848. So I've color-coded the different parts of it. Anything that's pink is a student's study room. Anything that's yellow is a librarian's office. Purple, we just have one purple in the middle at 101, is a classroom space. And this kind of brown tan color at the bottom is a library space. Um, this particular library space, 118, looks kind of huge on here, but it's actually that maybe 18 by 20 room you saw in the picture with the stacks. Um, that is basically our print collection, and that's our tech services office right outside of it. So we've got some student study rooms, just a couple, in the, quote, library. And then some more out here in the actual building. Um, our emerging technologies librarian is there in 113. So that's the first floor. Second floor, we start filling in the faculty. The faculty color is blue. Yellow remembers the librarian. So we've got one librarian here for about five faculty. Little study wing off to the north there and another large classroom. And the rest that's not filled in is just administrative, career services, that sort of thing. Okay. The third floor is where everything's really integrated right now, mostly because that's where all of our people are right now. We're a growing school, young faculty, small numbers, but we're growing. So everyone's office is pretty much on the third floor. So again, we've got these two faculty wings in blue, and each one of them has a librarian's office, and then the director's office is up here at the front. And then that middle space is that open reading area you might have seen in one of the previous slides, that tan space in the middle. So. You can tell that we are really embedded. So as David likes to say, sometimes we do reference by yelling. Because from that yellow block down to the blue block, it's not even the size of this, not even the length of this room. Right? So if someone needs us, they can basically just speak in a loud voice. And, and they do that quite often. I'll get, David, <laughs> what? I need the legislative history for this. When do you need it? In like five minutes. OK. Yeah, so. that's pretty typical interaction. So, um, so we've got that. So what this does, it's not only extremely convenient for the faculty because they're no more than you know, 30 or 40 feet from a librarian at any given time, it's really great for the librarians um, as a whole viewed by the student body, for instance, because they see us there working with the faculty. We have offices just like the faculty, so they tend to see us more as equals than I think they do in some other institutions, which is great. Um, and of course, the students study in that 301 space all the time. So if they have questions, they can come to us. And then they can just go next door to their contracts professor and ask their contracts questions. So it works really well. Um, and again, we're small, so everyone knows everyone. It's very friendly, very open door policy, communicative. Um, so that's the third floor. And the fourth floor is just study rooms in one classroom at this point. All right, so our whole concept, um, going back to this one, is a library without walls. So we're completely wireless throughout the building. You've seen the print collection is very small. People have access anywhere, anytime to all of our collection. So that's very different from the traditional model. I'm going to talk a little bit about our virtual reference service. This is a screenshot of my desk a couple of months ago. And no, I don't always have all of those monitors up and looking at all of them because I would go crazy, right? Especially if they all had different things. So we each have, no one, none, none of our faculty or librarians has an actual desktop with a tower and all of that. We just have a monitor that we hook into our laptop. Um, we also have one iPad that we're circulating for library reference. And Hein, I think, is sending us another one because we've subscribed so much to their services. So we'll be getting an iPad 2 at some point. And then I think all of us, all the librarians, have a smartphone, don't they? Yeah, I think we do. Except for our illustrious director, yes. <laughs> so we do virtual reference using Windows Live Messenger at this point, which is kind of an older model instant messaging service, but we found that it fits our needs. Um, it's, it's in real time. It's free. We have our students and faculty download it during orientation, so everyone has the same Windows Live Messenger system. 
and we do our reference schedule so that a, li a librarian is always on the reference desk, quote desk, online, right? So, and we do generous reference hours. I think it's 10 to 10 right now this summer. Um, so the students know that there's always someone online and the faculty know that there's always someone online they can send requests to you. And we all have the, the, um, the smartphone app for Windows Live Messenger. So if we happen to get hungry in the middle of a four hour reference shift, we can in fact go down the street, get something to eat, and we're still on reference. So if anyone has any concerns, we're right there. It may be a bit of a misnomer to say that we have no reference desk. I really consider us to have five. They just happen to be the desks in our offices, right? And people know where to come and find us. Okay. So how we do reference, again, we use that. Um, we use the iPad a lot, some of us more than others. Uh, we're thinking about going to Skype. So if anyone has used Skype, I would love to talk to you sometime after this presentation. Um, and I think I've just got a couple screenshots of what we actually use. So we do reference via email, of course, the slow way, right? But we still get a lot of faculty who send us email requests for reference assistance. This is what a screenshot of Windows Live looks like. So on the left is the little blurb that comes up on your desktop showing all of your contacts, says who's online and who's not. And this is a capture I did of one of our professors earlier this week who was asking me about how to cite the Tennessee code. So we're just going back and forth there. And then, of course, we have the iPad and the smartphones. And one, and of, the, uh, yeah, go ahead. one of the nice things about Windows Live Messenger um, is that it also has the, the audio chat capabilities and the video chat capabilities. So it could be as if you're right in the, the same room as a student, like looking at them. Um, not all students like to do that. Actually, I think very few of them en enjoy that. I think they, they prefer typing. Um, when we were on XP, though, we also had desktop sharing. So I, I was able to view their desktop, view applications on their desktop, and they were uh, able to view applications on my desktop, so if I needed to show them how to go uh, search for um, I don't know, administrative regulations, um, I, can, I can easily do that. Um, but when we switched over to 7, it just vanished. So 7 needs to come back, needs to, uh, to bring back the application sharing, because that was really nice. Um, one other thing about Windows Live Messenger that I forgot to mention, you can basically send a document across it. So if you needed to get a Word document or a PDF, you can do that live. It takes about three seconds. The person just has to accept your download. And sometimes we even do actual in-person reference, like you see here. I'm going to let David talk about CERC. Well, I just want to talk. The, the in-person reference, the interesting thing is, though, when I was at Charleston, we, we had a reference desk, and it was right around the corner from my office. And I was looking at the statistics, and on a regular basis, I would have two times, about three times the amount of reference requests from my office than actually at the reference desk. And I think the, the phenomenon was a result of the fact that students don't really like to approach somebody for help out, out in the open. Um, I th think that was it, but I, no, no, nevertheless, I had a lot more um, students come and ask me questions in my office. Um, I, I would like leave the desk and go back into my office and like two minutes later I might get somebody where I wouldn't, I'd be sitting at the desk for about two hours and I wouldn't see anybody approach me. So, uh, um, and you know, we're, while we're uh, doing virtual, we're also in our office um, I usually put my initials and the uh, room that I'm located in, so if students need, they can come and find me. It's usually, I'm usually in my office during uh, my reference hours. <clears throat> All right, this is our circulation desk. So I kind of lied, we kind of have a circulation desk. It's just really small and in the corner. Um, it's a self-checkout unit. So you can take the book and then scan your barcode that's located on your uh, ID, and then scan the book, or if it is a uh, media material like uh, CD-ROMs or CDs or DVDs, uh, we have it where they will come out 
of these <coughs> boxes like it's a uh, red box, and you'll get like the six CDs coming out uh, at one time. Um, when you when they return the book, they just leave it back on this this shelf here, and it's and it's not like it's in a place where people are going to just take books and run out. It's the uh, our, our reception desk, which is either manned by a receptionist or by security throughout the day, um, is facing that. And you, I think usually when there's CDs or CD-ROMs, um, they're taken back to our technical services library. Um, but I think the most uh, work that we do with circulation involves putting the C CDs, DVDs, and CD-ROMs back into the case. David, let me just say one other thing before we move away from reference and circulation. Um, you may be wondering what our students and faculty think of this policy, especially if they've had experience with traditional reference desks. And the answer is they seem to be great with it. We, um, we're very obsessed with assessment at Lincoln Memorial University, so we survey our interest groups constantly, and one of the questions we usually include is, you know, how do you feel about using the virtual reference service? How do you feel about using the virtual library? And we really haven't gotten any negative feedback no. at all. So the students seem to like it, the faculty seem to like it. So our users like it. Yeah. And that's who we're there. That's who we are there to serve. So, all right. Um, Treatment desk. All right. Now, I was always a big fan of like having a ready reference collection. And, and this is not exactly re ready reference, but what we've done um, is we've used uh, LibGuides as a platform to create sort of personal uh, libraries um, or personal uh, virtual bookshelves for our, uh, our faculty. So each faculty gets their own LibGuide on the uh, First tab, front page, we have you know links to their email, human resources, um, the law library, media site, Twin, and things that they use on a uh, regular basis. We basically have a form um, that we f have that our faculty fill out every year. It's the faculty interest form, and a lot of questions um, are geared towards what websites do you visit regularly, what uh, blogs do you subscribe to, um, what sort of what are you teaching? What resources do you need? What, are your, what is your scholarship focusing on now? What resources do you need? And basically, we will <coughs> personalize it. So this is one of our criminal procedure and tort professors. Oops. And so her interest is criminal and national security. So if we go over to criminal, you'll see I've taken, uh, I've gone through and linked uh, to criminal re procedure treatises, criminal law treatises, uh, criminal law uh, handbooks, tennis and Tennessee specific materials, um, and that just she just needs to click on it if she wants Wharton's criminal evidence, and th this this one links out to Westlaw next. And then she just has the treatise at her fingertips. Um, same thing with national security. looks a little different. Um, but West databases on national security law, Lexis databases on national security law, uh, related websites, CRS reports, um, and then an overview of <coughs> uh, United States national security law. Um, and then if they want what blogs subscribe to. So I have some links to the blogs and then I have an RSS feed from uh, basically her top three blogs. So SCOTUS, Criminal Law Prof blog and Extradition. Questions. Yeah, question. How many faculty members? Um, what, what do you, we had ten and full time. Full time. And we were we only create the LibGuides for the, the and it, it was nice because we started this from the beginning. So as they come on we build them. It's not, it's not as though we're going back and saying, okay, we have to create, <clears throat> you know, 20 lib guides now. But every year as they come, and then we'll, we'll alter them. Yes? So are you, uh, are you getting the information for the lib guides from the faculty, or are you just uh, 
we're getting, we're, we're, we ask specific questions like what their interests are and um, what, what websites they want on their LibGuide. And then every year they'll, they'll update it. Like, is there anything else that you want? Is there things that you don't want? So it's sort of an in interactive process. And then, and then they can tell us, you know, can you put this up and we'll put it up. It, there was another question. Yeah. OK. Um, David. Yeah. Oh, one. Yeah. They are, it's a, um, the URL is not listed on the LibGuides site. And it's I password protect. Um, that, so. When you log on, they, they you have to know the password, um, so that helps. Um, and then we also just have general reference for everyone. And I think there are some of our faculty um, keep this as their uh, their homepage, so they log on, it's there, that they, they use it, they love it. Some know that it exists, but never bother using it. And I think some use. Keep it as a favorite, um, knowing that all the links are there. Oh, let me log out. Close all that. All right. <clears throat> and then we'll talk about this. Um, all of our li librarians teach. Uh, we have a learning skills one is a mandatory course for all entering students, where we concentrate on legal research and legal citation. So it's basically 26 hour and a half classes on legal research for all first year students. It's like my dream come true. It's I, I get to you know stand there and talk about legal research and and you know horizontal story decisis and all that. And I found that it's actually helped um, a lot. I think after the, we get a lot of reference questions the first semester from the uh, our first year students as they're working through um, the numerous problems that we give them uh, numerous exercises but and then but after that first semester it, they still have to do research because then we have learning skills too where they're engaged in um, uh, predictive writing so they have to write uh, at least two memos and research for that and then their third semester we have the learning skills three which is uh, persuasive writing oral advocacy more research um, but they're they're constantly researching, and I we will get questions, but I don't know that we get as many because we spent a lot of time actually teaching them. In addition to uh, having our librarians teach um, Learning Skills One, uh, they'll also teach in uh, either legal Learning Skills Two, like legal writing, or our Academic su Success Program. Our Emerging Technologies librarian is teaching real estate transactions this summer. Um, and it, one of the nice things about that is it gives sort of uh, a contact for the students. It gives a face um, so that they know uh, the professor from having, the librarian from having them as a professor, from interacting with them, and that they feel, free, they feel more comfortable, uh, I think, approaching them, uh, which is always good. All right. You want to talk about the interactive technology? Sure. You can fill in the gaps. Okay. All right. So again, L LMU is a very tech-heavy uh, school. We have a lot of interactive technology. I'm going to go through this list really quick. So first of all, we issue all of our students' laptops during orientation. I know many law schools are doing that now. It's part of their tuition. They get Lenovo ThinkPads equipped with Windows 7, and we have wireless in throughout the building. All right. Each one of our classes at the Duncan School of Law is recorded via media site. That's a requirement. So every single class for every single professor every semester. And our professors know that coming in, so there hasn't been a struggle with trying to convince them that, yes, you are, in fact, going to be recorded. All right. Um, so those recordings are posted on media site. And what you'll see, let's see if I've got that slide. This is basically what a student's going to see if he goes back and looks at a class session. So any PowerPoint slides the professor had will be on the right hand, and then you'll see a little picture of the professor actually speaking on the left. Okay. 
So these can also be downloaded as audio podcasts. So we have several students, we have a nighttime program, basically. And several of those students drive a long distance to get to our school. So these audio podcasts have been great for them. They can re-listen to lectures on their way to and from school. Um, go back. In regards to interactive technology, another requirement that we have is that Two professors teaching the same subject have to have the same casebook and the same syllabus. So not only does that cut down on the so-and-so is a better grader than Professor B, it also um, it helps us assess those classes because we're doing a lot of assessment. So what they have to do is include in each presentation, every class, at least three multiple choice questions using this turning point software, which is just a PowerPoint add-on. It's very simple, you just download it. Um, and then you can pull the students. They log into a particular website on their computers, RW Poll, and they answer the questions. And then turning point generates reports based off of their answers. So the professor can see after class who got which questions right, where there needs to be improvement. Also during class, those results will appear on the screen. So you can see that 33% of your class answered something correctly. The, um, the results that you see on the screen are anonymous, so that makes the students happy. It's not like they're seeing their names up there with the wrong answer. Um, and we do require, again, three of those turning point questions for each class session. Anything else on turning point to mention? Okay. So although there's a picture of clickers here, we do not actually use clickers. They just use the website on their laptops to answer these questions. And this is a picture of one of our large classrooms. Um, what do you not see in this room at the front? A whiteboard. Or even go older than that. Chalkboard, right. So no chalk, no markers. Everything is completely digitized. Right. Um, again, we've got digital smart podium. So we use smart podium. That's a Crestron monitor on the left, and this is just the podium PC screen over here on the right. So this is what you'd see if you were standing up there as a speaker. Um, and then they have the mics on the tables, just like you guys have in front of you. Works the same way. So again, everything's recorded. So with the Smart Podium, we also have an interactive whiteboard feature on there, which replaces the chalkboard and the actual whiteboard. So we, we actually do have adjuncts come in, and they've brought their markers to mark on the whiteboard, and there's nothing there. So they have to get used to our new system. But we find it works really, really well. Let me see. So again. You've got these two large TVs at the front. Those are going to display, if you so choose, what's on the PC monitor or your laptop. And then there's the TV that you can kind of see mounted on that um, column in the middle. So that shows the instructor what's being viewed by the students. And of course, with the monitor and smart podium, you can blank out any of those screens that you need to. Say if you're asking a question, didn't want them to see the answer yet. Or if you just don't want to distract them when they're supposed to be not using computers, which does occasionally happen. And this is just a screenshot of what the Podium PC and the Crestron monitor controls look like. So you can send the images to the instructor TVs, the student TVs. You've got volume controls, and you've got record controls down here at the right. So again, this is what the Podium insides look like. So just actually, this is the recording controls yeah. in the uh. IT room. Excuse me. And we've seen that. Go, go back. We'll show them. We'll click on the. Um, I put it up. We you put something there. in. That's right. <clears throat> this is actually, if students want to go back, they just log into MediaSite um, and they can choose the class they want. But one of the nice things, uh, well, my, probably one of my favorite things about these smart boards is that you can yes, circle you things. So if you go back. Using that virtual whiteboard again. Oh, I can need to find one. So, right there, I can, while I'm going through and, and showing them how to, what they're looking at, I can circle things and say, all right, see in the blue, I, I what was I, I was. Ten point state. Yeah, I was showing them pin sites there. But they can go back and watch it 
and say, okay, well, how did he do that? Like, how did he go back and, and find that? And with the recording, it allows them to go back and, and, and sort of, I think, be more engaged in the class, um, and the, but then have this to fall back on. Um, and I think that, that helps a lot. Recording everything also makes peer evaluations very easy because you don't even have to be in the class to review your peer, right? As if you're a faculty member, you can just watch on your own time. So, yes, question. During the class, is, do the students have access to the display on anything other than the two displays on the front of the room? Not coming from us. They have their laptops, so they have. And they see the, the fact that the, what the No. Because see the those monitor sizes look to me like anywhere from about halfway back until the beam was on the screen. They're like fifty six inch. Yeah. They're um, I can't remember the exact inch dimension, it's something from fifty to seventy inches. They're very large. We haven't had a problem. And we can always just enlarge the text. <laughs> well that that room uh, that we're in fits twenty Five to thirty people, so it's that it's actually a, a smaller room, smaller screen. I think everybody can see pretty much everything out there. Yeah, so but no, the students do not see what's being presented on their laptop. So they're usually just, you know. Yeah, are they? Oh, right. At every classroom. One in every classroom. Do you really? Yep. Yeah. That's expensive. And then at two portables or one portable? One, one portable. portable. Yep. And you just run the server? You just run the server yourself? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Cool. All right. Class capture. And that's our advanced classroom courtroom. That's our. What you can't see in this picture, unfortunately, is our judge's podium where each judge has their own monitor and the jury box where each jury member has their own monitor as well, so they can view exhibits and such. And the two projector screens. Mm -hmm. And there are two TV screens on this back wall, too. <clears throat> All right. So the, the pitfalls of high tech. Um, you go what? Sometimes, if you have problems with the server, uh, you can't actually get to places you want to go. And that, that happens every once in a while. Another thing is there's always, when you're ad adopting new technology, new software, there's always going to be glitches now and then, which so causes our, some our glitches botheration. glitches are basically caused by improvement. Right. <laughs> like, for example, with when uh, we moved over to Windows 7, we lost some of the capabilities with Windows Live Messenger, but I'm sure that that's just a hiccup and that'll be fixed. Or we can, we'll find another solution, for example, moving to Skype. Um, hmm. Oh, Skype. that's right. Yeah. It's been several times since then. It's become evil. <laughs> uh, but I, I think that's, that's our, our greatest hurdle. I, I really don't know. I think it's just, you know, you're common problems that you're going to have with technology. Right, we have the occasional outage, but hey, we had the occasional book stolen at a traditional library too, so it's always something, stuff happens. You know, if there's a blackout, uh, you can't log on to like Westlaw to, to find a case, but then you can't, you don't have any light to open up a case book and read it. So, I mean, we're, no matter what, you're always going to have a problem. I, I, I think for, for our faculty and our uh, students, um, this has actually been more of a, a benefit than any detriment that it's really come up. So. Question? Open the floor. I have yeah. a question. Have you ever had, have the students ever said anything, or have you ever had any issues where when they've gone out to work, they've only had books to work with? Well, with, they've only had books. No, actually, that, that hasn't come up. There's been a concern about that. We do have books, and I think... Well, when I, how I teach is I start with a book. I say this is, and we have them, we, we pass them out. I, I put it on the Elmo and say, this is how the book uh, works. 
but this is how it works digitally. And for example, like the West key number system, we have the digest, but it's pretty much the same thing online now. So we, what we try to do is say, you know, this is how it started, and this is how it, it, it looks digitally, and sort of make that gap. Um, I don't really think I've had any students call me up and say, uh, how do I... Right, and one, one of the things we do, um, like at the end of the the, uh, the academic year this year, we had uh, a, a refresher course on, on legal research for those going out and clerking over the summer. Um, we haven't had any graduates yet, so that hasn't really been an issue. <clears throat> but I also remember when I clerked uh, a few years ago, uh, we would be sitting in, in New Brunswick, New Jersey, got some brownouts in the summer. And it, it happened probably about four times in the summer. And I remember there was, I'd go down to the library to look at the books, and the librarian would be like, you're the only clerk who ever comes down here. So I, I don't think, the, the other ones just sat and did something else. I mean, it, that's just sort of the mentality now. But no, we, we have no empirical evidence, obviously, to show what our students' experiences have been. Um, that's because, really, this year, um, our day students have just completed their first year, and our night students have completed their one and a half year. It's, it's kind of a strange situation. Yeah. So they haven't really been out to clerk yet, so we don't have that data yet. But our idea is not just that hopefully they won't struggle too much with books, but that they can be ambassadors for their firms and for the people they're working with, that they can bring new technology in because we do try to emphasize you know, free legal resources online and cheaper plans, and we try to do a lot with cost-effective legal research online. So we hope they can teach who's out there currently. <laughs> yes? Um, currently, we, are, we, we don't have our doors open to the bar. If they do... We, well, we don't market that. I think if they do come, they, they can use it. We don't have any um, public terminals, though. So if they're coming in, they're going to use the books, and they're not really going to find too much. Our, um, I think our, the plan is that after our first, first graduating class, we'll uh, put in the, the public terminals and then um, have the Westlaw Lexus access for... Uh, practitioners coming in. Right. The other law school in town, the University of Tennessee, is less than a mile away, and they have public services, and it's the state library, basically, FDIC, so a lot of the public needs are met there. Any other questions? Yes. Well, it was more for reference generally and kind of as a roving reference librarian because our building is fully wireless. Yes. Yes. Oh, no. <laughs> no, most of our faculty will buy their own. <laughs> so, no. Anything else? Yes. Do you foresee if your faculty grows that you can sustain the one librarian per four to five I think so. Uh, we're hiring two new librarians also. So well, we're trying to grow the library as we grow the faculty. Mm -hmm. uh, so front, uh, ladies first. Ladies first. Okay. You notice that you have a limited number of study rooms. And do you regulate that in any way to make a student body themselves? Not at this time. It's first come, first served. And really, we, we just went through the ABA site process in March, so of course they were asking a lot of questions about those numbers, and that we have plenty of seats for the students under the standards. It's, it's a matter of the students, you know, one person wanting to use a group study room. Right. And There's less of a question in regards to how much space you have and more of a question of how you allocate those resources with your students. If mm -hmm. you have a self-checkout, you obviously don't no, have we don't. a checkout system for the study room. No, we don't. It hasn't been an issue yet, so it's... If it becomes an issue, then we'll have to come up with a policy. And that's the nice part about being a young school is we're still open and flexible. So, was. With what request? Clerical. Oh. Well, th those usually, because um, I think also we have 
with each each wing, there's a, a faculty assistant. So, um, there, so there's faculty librarian, faculty assistant who usually handles that. Mm -hmm. Yes. Actually, I think we gain interactivity simply because, one, we don't have many meetings, so it's necessary for us to talk to each other often. And we like to get out of our little hallway space occasionally. So, no, I mean, we're constantly interacting. Yeah. Anyone else? Okay, well, thank you for coming. Thank you. Early dinner. Early dinner. <laughs>